Hello, and welcome to a very quick discussion on connecting with PowerShell to SQL Server. My name is Brian Cafferkey, and before I start, um, I'm not even going to do any slides this time. I'm going to keep to the commitment of making this faster. I don't have a SQL, well, I do have a SQL Server mug around, but I'm drinking out of my Python mug today, and actually wearing my Python shirt as well. <laughs> so I've got all Pythoned out, so I'm not sure why I'm doing PowerShell. Uh, but this actually came up as a question on Twitter of all things. Somebody tweeted and said, have managed to do something on SQL? And I realized that something I do all the time, I worked with SQL Server an extensive amount. I was an MVP on the data platform in my previous life as a consultant. And I thought, yeah, I should really do that. So one of the things to step back when we talk about connecting to databases is all the different methods there are for doing that. So one of the things I want to show you, for instance, is what are the ways we could connect? The most common way is something I believe Microsoft started, gosh, way back in like the late 80s maybe, it may go that far back, called ODBC. Let me respell that. Just testing you at home. ODBC, which stands for Open Database Connectivity. And that was an API standard that Microsoft issued, worked with other companies, I believe, at the time. And just a way that you could say whatever database you have, this is how we can establish a common protocol to interact with it. And so you can create ODBC drivers for you know, Postgres, for SQL Server, for Oracle, for any other MySQL or whatever. They all have those drivers. So ODBC is the most sort of open standard out there. And JDBC kind of Java's database connectivity kind of took a, a tip from that and also went in that direction. So that's the most common. I'm focusing on SQL Server and I believe the SQL Server native client is a bit more efficient. It also gets, it's a little bit easier to kind of do certain things like just connect without having a DSN, although you can do that with ODBC as well. So you don't have to set up a data DSN um, entry, uh, but also it's built into Windows as a rule. So you can just go in and use it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use SQL Server native client. Now, the only thing with that is it's not really designed to work with other databases. So it's not the open standard. Now, something you may have used in the past, I go way back and something that still sometimes uses something called ADO.net. I think that was really meant more for applications to interface with the database. Um, I don't use it much, but sometimes it can make sense to do that. If you've used SSIS, there are certain, I think, tasks in there that require an ADO.net connection. And OLADB, which is something, I don't think outside of SSIS, SQL Server Integration Services, many people use. But for some reason, it became the de facto standard in SSIS packages. And I'm pretty sure because Microsoft at one point said that's the way to go and everybody followed and that just became and uh, what is used and it works really well in that area. And then there's ADO, which goes back before ADO.net. There's even something called remote data objects, which is RDO and all kinds of stuff. The jet driver for access was an early driver. So there's many different ways you can connect. I'm gonna focus, as I said here, and I'm just gonna show you a function which you can get on github.com slash bcafferkey slash shared and just look under uh, PowerShell SQL and you'll find the script in there. All right, so the function name is invoke UDF SQL. I'm gonna actually make that lowercase. I usually do U, U, lowercase UDF SQL. Um, and I've got a caution here. So this code, I'm putting it together for you guys for demo purposes. It's not robust. It should really probably have, um, you know, try catch blocks around it and things like that. So use it your own caution, your own risk kind of thing. Play with it. You can change it to what you want. Make sure it's what you need for your own standards and your organization, etc. There's a nice link here I also put in the code. You can go follow that gave me some ideas to kind of improve on this. Uh, I am using command line binding because that gives us common PowerShell parameters, which is a really nice thing to do. And use param blocks to pass your parameters. Now, there is a different way to do this, but I talk about this in my functions area. Uh, but it allows you to do, if I wanted to, I'm not doing it here, but I could make these parameters required and do all kinds of verifications on them and validation. These are all strings, so it's pretty straightforward. And it's just the SQL server, which would be like, in this case, local, but it could be, you know, whatever your server instance name is, the name of the database, what query do you want to run? Now, not all queries return data, right? So I could do a query that says just delete a row, or I could say update a row. And that doesn't return data. So the is select is to say this is a select query so that I know in the function to prepare it to return a data set. And use credential is because in SQL Server, there's really two main ways you can 
have security set up for user authentication. One is a Windows integrated authentication. And with that integrated security method, Windows doesn't require you to actually create credentials in the database. So I don't have to re-enter my ID and password. When I connect to SQL Server, the credentials are automatically passed into SQL Server and it validates me without that. So it's very commonly used and it's a really nice feature if you're in a Windows environment because you never have to worry about this password stuff and what to do with password credentials. Uh, but if you aren't, and you can do this in SQL Server, they have database security, so this allows for that. Clearhost, you may get take this out if you don't like it. I just put it there for demoing purposes so it will clear the screen every time I'm demoing. And let's look at the code itself. So remember, use credentials is one of the parameters. It's right here. And if you said, yes, use credential, and by the way, this is a switch parameter. Switch parameters are Boolean. They can be true or false. If you do not pass them at all, it defaults to false, which makes them really handy because they're optional Boolean parameters by, de by their very nature. So is select is another one of those. So if I pass use credential, that means I want to pass in credentials. And I can test for it with just by saying if use a credential. Excuse <coughs> me. If use a credential, and then just do what I want. So if you've entered that, then I assume you want me to get your user ID and password. Now I don't want to pass, it's a really bad practice to ever store clear text passwords. I don't even want to give you my passwords here, even though it's just a dummy database and table. So it's a bad practice, so what I'm going to do instead is use this really cool commandlet, get credential. And when I tell it I want to connect with credentials, it's going to prompt me. If you're doing something in batch mode, if you can use the Windows authentication, it makes it easier for this kind of thing. If you can't, um, there's ways to do this, but you do need, you really want to avoid storing passwords places. In Azure, they have something called Azure Key Vault, which can be used to store things like that so that they're secure. Uh, but you do want to be careful, obviously. You don't want to be just leaving passwords around. So that's what this is going to do, get credential. And then you can see here, just to show you what get credential will do, if I enter this, it's going to ask me for a user ID and a password. And we'll see that in action in a minute. But that's what that does. And notice it comes back and it, it grabbed both of these. The get credential encrypts the password. I can't see it. So that's the nice benefit of using that. So then it's going to take the user part of that and pull that out. And it's going to take the password out and get that out. And I saw this online to get the password. It looks like you have to use this intermediate method to pull the password out. Still all encrypted. And then the key, the con object. So I'm creating a connection object here. And I'm using new object. And this is built into Windows. So I can just use this built in uh, .NET object, which is SQL connection. And then I tell it about the SQL connection. So in this case, I tell it what is the data source. So this is going to be like localhost or something. Uh, what's the database name? And here it's the user ID and password that I just received. And then, of course, the else part of this is if I didn't want to use credentials, I want to use integrated security. I do the same thing for the connection object. But all you notice is notice there's no user ID and password. It's just integrated security right there. Once I have my connection, then not done yet, I need to command. So the command object is here. And again, I use new object. And here you can see I'm creating a command object. I'm passing in the SQL query, which may or may not be a select statement and I'm passing in the connection object. So it's going to use that connection object to execute the query. Um, then I open the connection. And now I get into sort of the nitty gritty, as it were. And I say, if this is a select, if you told me it is a select statement, then you can see I'm doing a lot of work to get the data out of it's a stream. So I could get any amount of data coming through. And so I'm going to pull it out. Now I'm doing this in a pretty non-scalable way. So admittedly, this particular function is designed to take a snapshot of the data. So query the data, give me it in a table, an internal table basically in memory, and pass it over to me. So it's not designed for scale. Um, I'll probably do another follow-up somewhere where I'll do something where I can open it and then just keep streaming and saying, give me so many rows, give me so many more rows. But something would be more like you might use in a web app where you're going to get a chunk of rows at a time. But this is just designed to quick and dirty. Okay, uh, so you can see this. Uh, Let's go through this a little bit. So we're going to create an adapter object. Again, new object. And you can SQL adapter. And then we can see here a data set, SQL data set. So we've got a data set here. We've got an adapter. And notice we're using the command object we created before. So it's a very kind of a layering of objects we're doing here. We're going to use the adapter 
to fill in the data set. And if you're thinking this is not terribly intuitive, I have to agree. I think it's a little more work than it needs to be, but this is how it's laid out. There will, this part here, piping into out null, is just a way to suppress messages. It's like putting the void on a, a C function or whatever just to not see any output from it, uh, which is a good idea. You don't want excessive noises from functions because sometimes it will be interpreted as part of your stream of data, and when you're piping things, messages can get piped through and cause problems, so be aware of that. Once I'm done, I've got my data set. So my data set now is what I want to pass back. That's my in-memory table. If you use Python or something, think of it as a data frame, and you got the idea. Now, dollar sign connection, that's my connection object. I need to close my connection, so I'm doing that here. And then I just return my data set. Now, a nice thing about the SQL client is it can actually take multiple queries, and I could get multiple table sets back. I'm not going to get that complicated. I don't want to write the code to do it. You feel free to extend this to do that. So I'm just taking table zero, which is the first, uh, really the first set of data. And I'm only running one query in my demo. So I'm covered. Now, if I did not pass an, a select statement, and I would have said I wouldn't pass this one, then it assumes it's just something I, it's going to execute. And there's a method in there for that execute non-query. So that's not designed to return data. It's to do maybe delete a row, update, etc. So I'm going to run this, and that will just really just create this function in memory for me. It's actually already run, so I think I'm all set. It's already in memory. Let me clear this bottom of the screen. Now, a typical thing I often do, and I'm going to do here, is so that I could run that as many times as I want and then try it out, I comment out different versions of the use of that code. It's actually not a bad idea, at least I like doing it. I'm not going to say it's the best practice if you like it. Uh, in addition to putting the typical uh, doc comments that you can put at the top that help will find, you know, like the description and all that stuff, I often in my modules will put a couple of lines like this blocked off, and it will be an example of how to, how to actually call it. And sometimes I'll put a few different versions. I'm not sure it's the best practice, but I love to be able to go in, and even though you can get it from the help, Sometimes I see a couple of different flavors of it, and I'll say, yeah, you know, I want this one because this one has how to pass it with credentials, and I can just cut and paste it. Now, there are much better ways. There's things called uh, snippets and other ways you can do this, but sometimes I'll do it that way, and I just find it's kind of easy when I'm working. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to run the function. Notice I'm passing the SQL server. It's just local. I'm saying it is a select statement here. The tick mark lets me wrap this statement so you can see it all. The SQL database name. You can go get AdventureWorks. You can use any database you happen to have on SQL Server, etc. But in this case, I'm using a slightly out of date one, AdventureWorks 2016. I'm doing my SQL query. These are all just the parameters to this. This is just my string. Top, you know, basically the top 10 rows out of person dot person. And I'm going to pipe it into OutGrid View. I did a thing. Re just my last presentation was actually on different ways you can do formatting, and OutGrid View is a really nice one. So if I run that. I get this nice grid, and I can do things like I can sort by the person's, for instance, first name, middle name, last name. So I can do that kind of stuff. I have filtering criteria, so I could start looking for somebody named Erickson, like that, and I can search. So the outgrid view is really handy. There's actually some pretty advanced things you can even do with it if you get into things like pass-through options and things, which I'm going to cover in another video. But just wanted to show you that. So that's pretty cool. Now, the one thing about this is I used integrated security. And that's why I didn't pass the use credentials. So it made it a fairly simple statement. But if I wanted to use credential, I'll use this exact same thing. The only difference now is I'm passing use credential. When I run that, it's asking me to give the credentials. I say run, and it does the same thing. So there's really no difference in this. It's just that this one prompted me for credentials. Again, not great if you're trying to run this in batch mode or something like SQL Agent. Now, just to show you, like you could be doing something like this, and it kind of ties into my last presentation on user interfaces. What if I wanted to do something, run a query from a database, something like this, and I wanted to present it to the user in a way that looked halfway decent? Uh, I could use this method as well. And you can see it created an HTML file, and then I just used the browser to invoke it. So I could do that. I could also easily create it to a spreadsheet like CSVs. I can do things like that. But kind of handy to be able to do that. Um, so that's an option you have. And finally, I just want to show you an example. Now, this will 
give an error because the row I want to delete has a foreign key constraint. But just to show you that if I were to do this, this does not have the is, let's see where is that, is select parameter. And because of that, it's not going to try to return a result set. So it did give me some errors. As I mentioned, the foreign key constraint doesn't like, etc. But it, it did what I wanted it to do. It tried to delete and not return a table. So that's really about it. Um, I have not a lot to say here. And I usually have slides, but I decided to forego the slides in the interest of giving you some good information hopefully you find useful. You can again find this code out on my GitHub account. So github.com slash bcafk slash shared under PowerShell SQL. I'll also put a link, if I remember hopefully, to put that link in the uh, description of this video. Thank you, subscribe, like, and um, I'll probably be doing more things around the SQL area. There's a whole module that just lets you do all kinds of cool stuff with SQL, but I wanted to jump into this approach uh, really because I like the idea of just having a quick little function that I can put in a library somewhere and just call it whenever I need to read SQL. This one, again, is meant to be just get it all back, though, as a block of memory. So be careful about how much you try to bring back into that using this approach. All right. Thank you.